this is my Olympic moment. I now declare SBAC 2016 open. <laughs> So, uh, you know, I think first of all, when we look at SBAC, SBAC stands for SPJMR, Business Academia Conclave. I think there is a second meaning that we are trying to give to SBAC this year. So it is two meanings. It is also a student business academia conclave uh, because academia has traditionally meant faculty. And one of the things we really need to understand is that going forward, if you're really looking at partnership, sure, it is faculty and academics, sure, it is business but is also a new generation of employees. And that new generation of employees are represented in our students. So I, I, I really think we need a dialogue, between, uh, it's, it's a trialogue now, between all three of these parties. And now, uh, let me talk briefly about SBAC, and I think SBAC is a part of, is the linchpin in a set of initiatives around this larger goal of influencing practice. So when a business school says we want to influence practice, there are two or three things we need to understand. First of all, influencing practice is a two-way street. Uh, if you want to influence practice, you first need to understand it. And uh, for that understanding to happen, dialogue needs to happen. Uh, now, what is the broad idea behind influencing practice? I think the first idea is this. There is a lot of research that is done in academia which stays in papers and does not reach practice. Uh, a part of the reason is that some of that is best kept in papers because it is too theoretical to be practically applicable. The other part is it does not stay because the academics are concerned about writing the papers and getting the publications. Uh, the practitioners are concerned about their next quarter target. There is nobody to translate. So one of the big needs is translation. And that is a role that institutes which want to influence practice have to do. They have to take complex theory, distill it down, make it practical, bring it to practitioners, get into a dialogue. And, and uh, the opportunities once you do that are just immense. I will give you just two examples. I, I, I know of one organization. See, behavioral economics as a field has been around for over 15 years. Uh, but as recently as last year, an organization with a turnover of over 30,000 crores just apply, applying the principle of loss aversion to promotion communication was able to get a benefit in excess of 2%. And you do the math on 2% on 30,000 crores. And what is this saying? This is saying something as simple as when you communicate a promotion, typically organizations are used to say, if you buy 100 units, you will get 200 rupees. Now, loss aversion basically says that people dislike losing more than they like winning. So the same communication, you flip it around and say, please ensure that you buy 100 units because I do not want you to lose out on the benefit of 200. And when you just frame or reframe that communication, the impact goes up. And these are all small percentage changes, but they're operating on large bases. Um, second example, 1980s, there was a paper written by Holmstrom and Milgram on the multitask principal agent model. Now that sounds complicated. Essentially what it is saying is this. Suppose you have one person who's doing two tasks. One of the tasks is easily measurable. The other task is not so easily measurable. Or the other task has more long-term kind of outputs which cannot be measured in the short term. If you make the mistake of incentivizing the first task, what will happen is you will not get effort on the second task at all. Now, this has widespread implications in practice. But we have been fundamentally violating the principles of this model for over 25, 26 years. Why? Because nobody has taken that mathematics, distilled it down. So this, this, is, this is one clear role for influencing practice. Uh, the second uh, is, let me look at it from the business side. Uh, I honestly believe that Indian business is ahead of Indian academia, 10 to 15 years ahead. Because Indian business is moving towards global practice. Indian academic research is 10 to 15 years behind uh, global practice. But the point is that the cutting edge practice of tomorrow is going to come from India. Now, we as academics need to sit with you, understand what you're doing, help you refine it, and also take that to the world. Because the world needs to learn from India tomorrow. Uh, the second is that, you know, there used to be a time when organizations used to talk about five-year plans. And five years was long term. Today, one year is long term. 
Uh, and there are many reasons, but one of the reasons is how many people are look, taking a five-year view of even their careers within the organization. You know, so uh, now when you look at that, therefore, it is not that problems which are to, which have a two-year horizon or a three-year horizon are going away. So who's looking at those problems? Academics are paid to think. Why don't you let us look at those problems? So, so, so the point is that uh, there is a real scope for creation of value. The first step to creation of value is one, conversation. Uh, the second is elimination of stereotypes. Uh, there is too much judgment on either side of the fence. There is too much stereotyping. So first of all, let us meet regularly, let us talk, and let us debate and discuss. And SBAC is a small beginning in this direction. There, there is a lot more that we will do, but I think this is a significant initiative. Look at this as... And do, if SBAC is an event and we do one event a year and we forget about it, then we are clearly not doing what we are supposed to do. SBAC is a platform to initiate a dialogue. If that dialogue continues and matures into partnership, then this makes sense. Otherwise, this is a mere beginning. So the value that we can create if we truly have the openness to work together is great and we need to do it. Because if India needs to become a superpower, then we need to work together. And we need to work together at a larger level, not only for business that will uplift the needs of the top 20%, but to also figure out how business needs to reach the bottom 80% of the population. And, and uh, for the India story to continue, it is clear that unless the India story moves into rural India, the sustainability is suspect. So, th so this, is, this is kind of uh, one piece that I wanted to talk about. The second piece, and um, I'm, I'm going to set this up for Lata to take it up on the HR front, and I'm going to just touch a range of issues, okay? So I'm going to touch a range of issues, not necessarily with a structure, and then put a final point to this. So when we look at people issues, I, I think two or three important people issues, and let me start with a fundamental thing. The children of today have been brought up differently than our generation. Ours was a generation brought up to accept that parents were figures of authority. Disagreeing with parents was the exception and not the norm. This is partly the responsibility of all of us as parents and partly that the children are different and partly the digital age. But today parents become friends to children much earlier maybe at the age of 12 or the age of 13, and depend, depending on which generation and your own per particular parenting style. But the point is, therefore the children of today are used to being led and managed differently. Their idea of hierarchy in relationships is very different. They expect far more equality. This to my mind is the first and most fundamental challenge that the new age employee who's coming into the workplace cannot be led in a hierarchical way. Have our leadership styles adapted? Have our management styles adapted? Is the theory we are teaching in business schools adapting? Have our teaching styles adapted? So one big kind of issue. The second issue, we are going the US way. Entrepreneurship is becoming fashionable, which is good, which is great. Because, you know, if you look at the best B schools in India, clearly we need to create more job creators. But industry also needs those guys. So is industry ready to accept employees with an entrepreneurial bent of mind? Can you give people more responsibility at an early age? Are you really creating those empowering and enabling frameworks? If somebody wants to be an entrepreneur, is there a framework where he can incubate a business within a large company? Are we thinking about these issues? Um, okay, uh, this is a common one. This is the thing about um, my generation is the digital migrant generation. We were taught technology by our children. Uh, the, the kids who are coming in, and you'll see our students present, they are the digital natives. I have a further concern that many of our senior management are, will become digital migrants someday. So you have a serious problem in organizations. You need to strategize around digital. But at the very top of the organization, there is resistance. And a large part of resistance because they themselves are not regular users. So the challenge of enabling senior management and how do we even look at things like reverse mentoring tomorrow? Saying Because you know the best guys to teach senior management how to use digital are the fresh entrants. Are we open enough to look at that? I mean, I know Unilever has moved to that and other companies are talking about that. Um, you know, I was brought up in the Drucker world, where you had unity of command. Increasingly, people are working in matrix organizations where your boss is not your only boss. 
So how do you manage in a world where your boss is not your only? And I, you know, I have seen many, many multinationals. Very few get the matrix right. Very few are able to make the matrix work, operate in a matrix. Because you know, the, the point is, how does a national country head work when the people reporting to him are actually reporting to somebody in Asia? So how, how do you manage these trade-offs in an organizational context? Is kind of an interesting issue. Um, this issue of transversal projects, as you're running projects across the globe, more and more you have to manage projects with people in different countries, in different roles, with different KRAs. So this phrase that we hear very often, influence without power, how do you get people to do what you want when your roles and goals are fundamentally misaligned? So this project management and the challenges of project management are no longer restricted to the construction industry. It has gone global. It has gone across industry. Um, big, big issue. My second last issue is on diversity. And uh, diversity, and I'll talk about three themes. Uh, and uh, this is the first thing I'm going to tell you is a little funny, but it's actually much more sad, uh, which is that uh, I went to a large multinational company, and there were four groups of regional managers sitting, and the issue of gender diversity came up. And in one of the regions, uh, I will not tell you which part of the country, but uh, they said, yes, we had diversity, but she left. <laughs> so you had uh, one lady in the team, and she left. Now, there are two problems with this. The first problem is the ratio where you had only one lady. The second problem, which is actually very scary, is think of an organization where there was one lady who had the courage to work in a male-dominated function, and she was labeled diversity. How, how easy is it to work in an organization where your label is diversity? So when we look at gender diversity, you know, I think what we are doing in most cases, there are enlightened organizations, is lip service. We are doing the percentages, we are not doing the fundamentals. Uh, I, I'm not just being populist here, we need to start with the men. We need to start with the men. Uh, the male attitudes are the biggest block to gender diversity, that's one. Secondly, it should not just be a mandated percentage. There is enough research to show us, and we know this, that if you have diversity in the boardroom and your top management team, your innovation outcomes improve. Why does it improve? There are people who understand 50% of your consumers better. You know, husbands don't claim to understand women. So the point is that if you do not have women on your board, how can you claim to understand the consumer in a complete way? But there are larger things. I mean, there are issues in terms of thinking differently. But the point is that you should do it because it's strategic. You should not do it because there's a percentage. Uh, the second issue is culture. And increasingly, you're doing work across country boundaries, sometimes on the telephone, sometimes on Skype, sometimes on. And when you look at culture, I think we need to move beyond how we shake hands and how we bow. and. You know, that first level of orientation which says don't make silly mistakes in interacting with another culture, we need to grow beyond that. And talk about cultural adaptability. And that to me is I can interact with any culture. One, I am sensitive to these. Two is I have genuine curiosity about understanding somebody different from myself. And three is there is a third level. And that third level to me is when you meet somebody for the first time, it's nationality. When nationality moves to humanity, then you have truly moved to cultural diversity. When you are able to see people as human beings first, appreciate the differences, but recognize that 90% is similarities, and that's what we build on. Um, the final aspect of diversity, and this is not talked about, is generational diversity. Today in BPO's financial sector, many organizations, People become leaders for the first time at the age of 24 or the age of 25. It's a challenge. People who are not fully sorted emotionally are leading other people. How do you prepare them? It's a tough one. So, uh, you know, finally, I, I want to leave you with this thought that uh, maybe the final definition in this is we need to change our definition of leadership. Leadership in India, and I think in the rest of the world so, but more in India, has been hierarchical, status-based, and based on position. The question which every leader of tomorrow must ask himself or herself, if I did not have the position, would people still follow me? 
and this may seem like a very harsh barrier but i'd like to close with this if people would not follow you i'm sorry you're a manager you're not a leader thank you